That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Folks, I'd like to read the scripture for you tonight, the book of Revelation. Chapter number one. And verse number four. The word of God says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, <clears throat> grace be to you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, and to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests to God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Father, I pray that you'd anoint the word as it goes forth. Shed some light, my heavenly Father, through this veil of tears. Lord, give us wisdom from the word and inspiration in our soul from the precious Holy Spirit. In thy name we pray, amen. There was no doubt in the mind of the Apostle John when he wrote the book of Revelation that the Lord Jesus Christ is Almighty God. So there will, that is a... Uh, that is a mind-boggling revelation for all of us tonight to understand the simple fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is God. The last book in the Bible is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which means it is the revelation about Him, not only a revelation about Him, but it is a revelation from Him as to what's going to come in the future. The Lord Jesus Christ is said to be, in the book of Revelation, the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the ending. He's the first and the last. In plainer words, all that constitutes our speech, knowledge, communication with each other has anything to do with mankind. The Lord Jesus Christ is the sum total of every bit of it. It only has meaning as it relates to the Son of God. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The Lord Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Without Him a man walks in darkness. If you appeal to your intellect, your ability, your experiences, your education, you're walking in darkness. The Bible said, casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We need to learn how to think. If we read the Word of God, it will give us what we need to think. We look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. That's what we're looking at tonight. But the things which are not seen are eternal. The eternal and the almighty are one and the same. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. There is none beside him. He's all there is. He's all there is now. He's all there ever has been. And he's all there ever will be. I thank God tonight for the fact that I know that one that is from everlasting to everlasting. I'm just a creature. I'm just a man. I showed up on this earth from a pile of dirt. I'd have no meaning, no existence, no life, no purpose had it not been for that master creator, the Lord that breathed into my nostrils the breath of life. The, the, the unique thing about a man is the fact that the breath of God became the soul of a man. It doesn't say that about an animal. It doesn't say that about an angel. It doesn't say that about a cherubim or a seraphim. But it says that about a man. Therefore, the Bible says man is made in the image of God. He's a unique creature. There's nothing like him. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that one day that God's going to put all things under his feet. His is referring to the man. It's quite a remarkable thing when you think about the destiny of a human being, that what God made us for, why he put us here, a mind, my friend, that transcends time and space, a mind that knows all things from the beginning. He knows everything there is to know. He's almighty God. We call it omniscience. That means that he knows all things. He knew the moment I would be conceived. He knew the moment I would bring, I'd draw my first breath of life. And thank God he knew the moment I bowed my head and said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and into my soul. And he said, Save me. That's the Almighty. That's that one, that wisdom. That's that eternal wisdom. That's that eternal being. That's the one it says in Revelation chapter number one 
I am the Almighty. That's quite a statement in the Old Testament. God said, Abraham, walk thou before me and be perfect, for I am El Shaddai. I am Almighty God. If he's Almighty God, that means he can save you. If he's Almighty God, he can deliver you. If he's Almighty God, he can heal you. If he's Almighty God, he can raise the dead. John chapter number 11, he said, He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Just the other night, I reached down, took hold of the hands of this dear soul. We got near to each other, and I prayed with her and talked with her and said, Preacher, I want you to know something. There's something dancing around on the ceiling in this room. I don't know if she told her children about that or not, but she told me that there's things moving around in here. I said, Surely that's for you, honey. God gave that to you. That's for you. He's preparing you for something far greater than this old flesh could ever understand or ever see. Man has a destiny. God had a reason for making you. No doubt probably that some of the angels are jealous. No question about it. For the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter number 1 that when God made the man, brought him on this earth, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he showed up, not the man but Christ, when the Son of Man was born, the Son of God, the Bible said, let all the angels of God worship him. No doubt, my friend, when they saw that little baby in the manger, they had to think twice, am I going to worship a baby in a manger? And God Almighty said, that's my son right there. The Bible says in the book of 1 Timothy chapter number 3 that one of the great things of the mystery of God when Christ came into the world, that he was seed of angels. These angels saw him. They saw the God-man. They saw God manifest in flesh. You see, all of this, my dear friend, was worked out before man was ever made. You live in a temporal house of clay. The Bible said that you have this treasure in earthen vessels. It's what's inside you that matters. You are not that flesh that you're walking around in. I hate to shock you tonight with that. You can wash it, pamper it, take care of it, feed it, rest it, and all of that, but it's going to wear out. It's not going to last but so long. But that inward man, the Bible says, is renewed day by day. That inward man has his identity, not from this earth. Think about where you came from. When God breathed into Adam's nostrils a breath of life and he became a living soul, that meant that Adam's identity came from above. The very breath of God breathed into his nostrils. That means that we came from above, not from beneath. That therefore, the Bible says, from dust thou art to dust thou shalt return. Body, and that's where the body's going, back to the dust of the ground. But they tell us that when they go off into the tribes that have never seen anything but their tribe, and they talk to these people, and they look deeply into their heart and into their soul, all over the world, it makes no difference where they go, that there's something ingrained in the very nature of a man. And you know what that is? Eternity is in his heart. I don't know if you've ever seen anything like it or not, but about 20, 30 years ago, they were shooting cattle out west because of some kind of a disease. They would walk up with a rifle, walk right up next to that cow, and they'd shoot that cow in the head, and it would drop dead in its tracks right there. But the cow next to it would just kept on chewing its good, as if nothing had happened, as if it had no consciousness at all of the fact that a cow right next to it had died. It had no idea that there was anything past its life chewing that could. You see, eternity is not in the heart of a cow. Eternity is not in the heart of a dog. It's not in the heart of a cat. It's not in the heart of an animal. But it's in your heart. Eternity was put in your heart by that one that made you and raised us from the dust of the ground. Just think of the privilege that God's laid aside for a human being. Just think of the future that God has for us. This little temporal void that we have here, the Bible said, this earthly house of this tabernacle, if it were dissolved, this light affliction, which is but for a moment. When you think about eternity, you must think to yourself, my goodness gracious, what's 70 years? What's 80 years? What's 100? What's 150 to eternity? There's something about us tonight that cries out for something greater than we are. There's something inside you that cries out and says, there's got to be more to it than this. There's something deep down inside the soul of a man that said, Lord God, what am I here for? What's this all about? And you'll hear a voice that it comes from that word of God that says, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest for your souls. I am the bread of life, he said. If you're hungry, you'd come to me and I'll feed you. I am the water of life if you're thirsty. I've got something for you to do. I'm the light of the world. Come to me and I'll give you light. My friends, he's all of those things. In the Old Testament, the Bible says that when God raised up Moses, he brought him out from the desert of Midian, been there for 40 years. He began to speak to him from a burning bush. 
What a marvelous sight Moses must have seen. He looked into that bush and he marveled at a bush that burned, but it was not consumed. And then a voice began to speak to him. Somebody from another world began to speak to Moses. Somebody a whole lot higher than him began to speak to Moses. And he gave him a commission and said, I want you to go back to Egypt. I've heard the cry and the affliction of my people, and I'm going to deliver them. And Moses said to the Almighty, what am I going to tell them? Who am I going to say sent me? Who am I going to do? What authority do I have to go back into Egypt and deliver these people? And God said, you tell them that I am hath sent you. That Hebrew word I am is translated from Haya, Haya, Haya. You look at that word and dig deeply into it and you'll find that it cannot be defined. It simply means the everlasting, eternal, existing one. You go back and tell your fathers and tell Israel and you tell those that, that you came from that that almighty eternal being that spoke to Abraham, that almighty being that raised up Adam from the dust of the ground hath sent you. That was good enough. They understood that. They understood that eternal I am. And when the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel of John began to tell them who he was he said I am he said before Abraham was I am in Revelation chapter number one he said I am the almighty that's who we're dealing with tonight we're dealing with one my friend that raises us from the dust of the earth breathes into our nostrils the breath of life and we become a living soul I've got a reason for living because I know where I'm going I'm not in the land I'm not part of the dying I am the living I knew John Whitaker, knew him well, loved that dear brother. Anybody that ever knew John Whitaker would never forget him. John Whitaker had a personality about him, had a persona. You knew when he showed up, he was John. You either loved him or you didn't love him. I loved him. I hope you do. I believe you did. John Whitaker was the kind of man that spoke what came to his heart. He just simply spoke off the cuff. Just the kind of man, my dear friend, that would get a hold of your heart, get your attention. And I loved him because John Whitaker was real. You see, I can, I can love somebody that's real. Yes. These actors and actresses out here in Hollywood, when they're not acting, they try to be real. They need to go back to acting. Yes. They, don't, they don't understand what the real world is about. Go back to your bubble, actor. You don't have a clue what's happening. I love real people. And so was Shirley Whitaker. She was real. Just like John, she was real. Entirely different person. Entirely different person. But she was who she was. And you either loved her or you didn't love her. There are those that love me and don't love me. There are those that love you and don't love you. Aren't you glad tonight the Lord Jesus loves us all? Amen, amen, amen. I had such a wonderful meeting with her the other night. Spent a good bit of time with her. All the children were gathered together in the room, and I bent over and I prayed with her. And held her dear to me, and she took hold of both of my hands with her hands and said, Preacher, I love you. I said, I love you too, Shirley. I love you, and I know you, and I've known you a long time, and I know where you're going. I know you're going to go home to be with the Lord. And I think there's a big old fellow up there waiting on you right now. <laughs> On the banks of the river. They've got a song in our song books that says, I'll meet you by the river. What a wonderful thing. So what river is that, preacher? That's the river or water of life that flows out of the throne of God. That it's got trees on either side of it and they're blooming 12 times a year. It's a beautiful place. It's got streets of pure, transparent gold. It's got walls of jasper. The angels are singing the glory of God and the Son of God's the light thereof. No death, no sorrow, no suffering, no tears, no pain, no crying shall I ever enter into that land. It's a land where you will see your destiny. Once you've left this old body of flesh, this old body of clay, this old body of death, sail, my friend, into the presence of the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. No intermediary transitional state. Immediately from the moment that you take your last breath here, you're breathing there and you're walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. What a shock it is. There he waits on her and the two of them arm to arm turn around and John says, I've been here a while now. Let me go show you a few things. I think you'll be interested in these. Yeah. And away they walked together, two sweethearts in love with each other as they had for years. Now they're reunited in heaven's great glory. That's what it was made for, friend, for us to approach God, come to his presence where God can dwell with us and we can dwell with him. Yes. We've got a flesh to, in here, a body of clay that's a body of sin, sorrow, destruction, and there's a wall sometimes of separation. But there, there will not be. That wall will be gone and that soul will take its flight and that spirit will unite with the father of spirits and 
there in his presence we shall shout and rejoice forevermore. And then as he turns to his creation, and those are the redeemed, not the angels, not the seraphim, not the cherubim, not all of them, my dear friend, none of them. Nowhere in that Bible does it ever say one time that an angel or a cherubim or a seraphim ever prayed, but a man does. Nowhere in that Bible does it say that an angel or a cherubim or a seraphim is made in the image of God, but a man is. There's some kind of a destiny for us that's above the angels. It's above the cherubim. It's above the seraphim. My, my, my. What a future you have. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, it's nothing but bright. The Bible says the, the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more to the perfect day. The perfect day, my dear friend, is the zenith. It's the point where the sun reaches its highest point, and there, next moment, it begins to go down and recede. That's where we're headed, dear friend. The path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more to the perfect day. It never recedes. Once we reach there, we stay there in eternal glory, eternal light, eternal bliss, eternal joy, and we shout and redeem, for the redeemed have something to sing about. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah to God. I'm not what I used to be. And tonight, if you've rejected what I'm saying, there's no hope for you. But these two that I preached, I preached her now. This dear soul, Shirley, and I preached her husband. Both of them, no question in my mind, they're with the Lord. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. Hallelujah to God. Yeah. It's a time of sorrow, yes. But the Bible says we sorrow not as others, others that have no hope. Not as others. There's sorrow, sure there is. The tears, that's just natural. The Lord stood at the tomb of Lazarus and the Bible said he wept. Yes, brother. Shortest verse in all the Bible. Was it a put on? Was it alligator tear? No, 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 no. Lazarus was his friend. He loved him. And he had to feel that sorrow in order to be able to minister by the Holy Ghost to your sorrow. He had to feel that as your great high priest. And he feel it. He felt it. Feel it he did. And he wept. But I'll tell you right now, my dear friend, he weeps no more. Oh no, he sits at the right hand of the Father, and my life is hid with Christ in God. This old body's going to fall away one day. And you know something? An old soldier said a long time ago when he was drawing his last breath, coming down to the end, led many troops into battle, and at one time had even tried to go before them, and they wouldn't let him. Last thing he said, strike the tent. <laughs> Fold it up, put it away. I'm done with it. Boy, she struck the tent. Amen. Girls, you know you had a mama. Yes, you did. I envy you greatly. You had a mama. You had a mama. May God bless you. May God comfort you. And the Holy Ghost be with you. He will. He never, he'll never leave you. And he'll comfort you through scripture. The promises of God. God bless every one of you. You know something? The Bible said we're looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Shucks, before we leave out of here tonight, we may be gone in this place. It wouldn't bother me a bit. Amen. Even John on the Isle of Patmos, he said, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come. Father, I pray, bless your word now. Comfort these dear folk. Heavenly Father, inspire them through your scripture and give them vision, Lord. Let them be able to look past what they're looking at right now. I know this is the body of Shirley. I know that. I know that. It's the earthly resemblance. It's the earthly tabernacle. But that's not Shirley. She's not here. We're not burying Shirley. She's not going to the ground. She's already with you. And Lord, lift our minds up tonight and see that. Help us understand that and look beyond this. In thy blessed, sweet, holy, righteous name I pray. And for Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen. Amen.